glad to be back in game week. Um, I think we had a productive buy and um, I think any chance to reset, recharge, to try to get a little bit healthier and um, kind of set our sights on the next stretch ahead. And we got a we got a uh, a six game run here that's going to be challenging, but a lot of fun. And starts with a great opponent in Alabama. You know, uh, anytime you can welcome a number one ranked team into your home stadium, um, again you 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 face a great challenge, but with a great challenge is a great opportunity um, and a chance for us to to measure ourselves uh, against the best in the league. Um, have a ton of respect for Kalen DeBoer, a, a guy that I go back with to my South Dakota days. Um, has always been someone that I admired and felt like uh, does things the right way. Obviously an excellent football coach who um, has positioned his team to, to um, again, to be at the top of the, of the country. So um, excited for the opportunity. I know our players are excited too. Um, I think we've, we've been a spirited team and a competitive team, um, so uh, not surprised that they're looking forward to the opportunity that awaits them on Saturday. I think the focus this week and what my message to them has been is we can't skip any steps. So this is about getting everything we can get out of our process to um, best position ourselves to make the plays that we'll need to, to make to win a game on Saturday. And um, again, we're excited, excited to be back home. Um, refreshed from the bye and, and um, looking forward to a great week and a, a great weekend. So with that, I'm happy to open up for questions. Clark, so were you at South Dakota when you was at Sioux Falls? I was at South Dakota State, um, and that was my first full-time job. So we were, I think we're both still pretty young, if I could say that. Um, but we were certainly young then, and um, Kalen had already built a great reputation as a head coach. and. I used to see him at clinics and, um, you know, it's just, it's been a lot of fun to follow his career um, because I, I admire the way he worked his way up through the ranks and, um, yeah, I mean, he, he was always someone that stood out as, as um, a good person first and like a really skilled football coach and, you know, I think he's every, every step along the way he's proven that both both of those things to be true and um, obviously off to a great start at Alabama. Offensively does it look kind of the same for you going forward just grind out the clock let Diego make plays or is there anything you guys maybe want to do a little differently and better going forward? Well it, grinding out the clock is a part of the the strategy but so is you know taking shots and, and being an explosive offense too. It, for us, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna start outside of our identity, you know, like so we want to establish a physical run game and we want to, um, you know, allow for Diego opportunities to create and to keep us on schedule. But again, if you look at that first drive in the Missouri game where we went, um, you know, first and ten to second and five, um, then had a procedural penalty that put us to second and ten, and then a you know a fumbled pitch that put us to third and 17 you know that that's not going to be a formula for us um, I think the second drive if I'm not mistaken started the same first and 10 second and five to a conversion uh, set up another conversion and the fifth play into that drive was a long pass to Joe McVay that that's what our offense wants to be um, you know, we have capable players to stretch the field vertically uh, Diego has shown his ability and I think there's even more in there in terms of um, targets down the field being open and I think Tim's done a great job of designing those shots so um, you know want to get to those shots and in order to get to those shots we have to as you say possess the ball and and uh, accumulate snaps um, and stay on schedule so that's going to start with a physical run game and um, that run game is going to again channel through Diego. I think you have to be careful sometimes overcompensating. Um, I think sometimes the things that you design in an effort to neutralize a really good player like Jalen, um, you, you can end up kind of deviating from kind of what your base structure, or your base identity is. I think what is what what a player like um, Jalen 
uh, challenges you with is to be at your very best within the fundamental technical aspects and the tactical aspects of the of the game you want to play. And so, um, certainly, we're gonna you know every every time the ball snapped, there's opportunity for an explosive play. Um, where he is particularly good is, um, listen, if you don't account for him on um, the, the bypass zone reads, he's going to pull it and out leverage and outrun the defense. I mean, he's, he's shown that against the very best in the country. So we're certainly not immune to that. We need to know exactly where the leverage points are and how to get to ball level and force him back inside. You can't always have an extra player for the quarterback, so there is an element where you're going to need to play um, with great uh, block destruction and and um, and again, you know, minimize the, the the run lanes that he has um, and give pursuit time to catch up because um, you can't survive a game against these guys keeping the safety split. You know, you're going to have to close the middle too. Um, the other area that that he'll obviously hurt you is evading pass rush and I think he's really good with um, like vertical escape lanes and it, it's usually not to puncture you vertically it's once he once he penetrates or pierces the the um, the pocket he, he has a knack for for um, circling the defense so if you stack the ball in those situations um, if you see guys collapsing from outside in on top of the football he's gonna he's gonna circle you and make you pay and that you know I mean you saw that on Saturday night. So, for us, again, we this is not anything new, right? We talk about how we suffocate the ball. We talk about how we leverage the ball. We talk about how we vice the ball. You know, you always should be working together to um, to down the ball in space. Again, we're playing against an opponent that if we're not on top of those things that we've trained um, since the start of fall camp, he'll make you pay. But the, the kids know, the players know that, and we've talked about it and. Um, there will be some things that we do that, you know, within within our identity that uh, looks to limit um, him and his ability to be effective. But um, he's going to get his plays too. You know, this isn't a game where you're going to sit there and, and think, you know, we're going to not absorb yards. This this comes down to explosive touchdowns and the ability to limit those and um, and to force them to go the long hard way. It's a really explosive offense. Uh, it's frustrating because I think we've been a, you know, we've been a good, we've been a disciplined team with respect to penalties in our past. It's always been something that we've taken pride in. Um, obviously, you know, we've not always protected the ball like like we have this this season, and so, um, you know, we we've spent a lot of time through the bye week talking about the need to clean up penalties. We have officials at every practice, and you know, we've. <clears throat> You know, made sure that we're coaching and there's alignment within our coaching staff, what the messages are in the position rooms and, um, you know, with our captains, what the messages are in the locker room about the need to play penalty free. Um, we're going to harp on that in our process, <clears throat> but those problems aren't solved on game day. You know, they're solved in the creating the understanding and, and really coaching through some of the uh, fundamental technical aspects, you know, um, you know, we had we had a few holding penalties today in one on ones defensively. Like that's not okay. So we point those things out. We talk about you know where where those issues come up, why they come up. You know what the players experiencing. We 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 try to coach them through and, and define the the ways to to be more effective within the rules of the game. And on Saturday, it's going to be about defaulting to your training. You know, and and look, we're not going to play a perfect game. Um, and again, you're not solving those problems on Saturday by yelling and screaming. It's going to be about uh, referring back to the things, the messages that we carried and the way we trained in practice to, to redirect quickly and focus on the next snap. You know, what we can't have are <clears throat> the undisciplined penalties where we're, you know, getting called from sports and like conducts and late hits and those kind of things. That, that has to be eliminated. And, you know, we're not... <clears throat> we're not fully supportive and aligned on the mission when we do those things, when we play that way. And so, um, 
again, I, I, I expect those to be gone. I, I think the the normal effort penalties that show up will be there. Hopefully we've done a great job coaching and messaging and, and, and demonstrating the fundamental technical ways we can improve that. And so we see a cleaner game on Saturday. Uh, how is your injury situation coming off the bye? It's good, uh, not perfect, but it's not going to um, – it's not going to be this, you know, kind of heading through the middle of the season. I uh, think on the whole, you know, we're, we're returning to a level of health that's exciting. Um, we'll have the full report tomorrow, but, <coughs> um, you know, m most of the guys are folded back into practice now and, and available other than the long-term injury guys. No, no one added uh, to that list last week, which is always a plus. And, um, you know, certainly, again, getting guys back, which um, – which will help us against a really good team. Mark, what did you make of the way the team approached the bye? How did your emphasis points be on penalties throughout the week? Um, really, we, we, you know, the, the emphasis points was just kind of um, unpacking, you know, the season to this point where we've, where we, you know, like I'm never going to take for granted the fact that I have a team now that, that loves to compete. You know, I mean, I, uh, through three years, you know, I've not always gotten in front of a group of guys where, you know, 100% were aligned in that respect, just that competitive mentality, that competitive mindset, and I celebrate that. Um, I'm never going to take that for granted. But um, <clears throat> we do have a strategy here, and the players understand that strategy, and we have to play within it. And so demonstrating to them, independent of the penalties, where we can, you know, control the game offensively, where we can create opportunities for our offense on defense by turning the ball over, where we can limit points defensively and exp uh, specifically explosive touchdowns, <coughs> um, and where we can win field position on special teams. You know that that has to be captured in our training every day. That identity, that strategy, right? And when we play that way, um, you know we're going to have opportunities to celebrate in the locker room after the game. Why? Because we have the spirit, the competitive spirit, and the energy, and the belief. Um, and so we have to play smarter, and smart teams win. But, um, and look, there'll be games where, you know, it's not like we're going to line up and win every matchup. That's okay, too. These guys understand that. You know, it's a team game, 11 guys on the same page, executing the call, playing with the competitive spirit we have. We've proven the resilience to fight back and the resolve to fight back. Um, the message during the bye week is, you know, let, let's let's now take the next step and play a smart, clean game and play to our strategy. Um, as far as the team's mentality in the bye, it, they were fantastic. I thought we had a great three days of work, and then you know, we came back on Sunday after a day off Saturday, and um, I I thought probably had our best, you know, in season practice this season. So it was physical. It was communicative. There was energy. Um, it was sustained, and we we were you know that was a heavier load than a typical Sunday because of the bye. So it was an extra Alabama day. Um, <clears throat> so these guys are excited. They're excited to play. It it's fun for me to be around them because again they carry that energy that that you want your team to have. And it's you know every opportunity we get out there we don't get back. You know let's go be really proud of the way we play and. Um, these guys have a chip on their shoulder. I mean, it's just, it's fun. It's fun to be a part of. So there's more for us out there. You know, if we clean our game up, we play to our strategy. I mean, we're going to, we're going to have opportunities to win games. And, and um, I love the, the mindset of the team that way. reminded me of some of the work I used to do in the flat when they would throw me the ball, Chris. Um, he's got uh, some of the best balance and body control um, and that, I, that I've seen. I mean, and again, I think when you watch him, um, I, 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 there's a few plays that stand out in my mind where he's making plays on the ball um, as he's, his body's, you know, contorting and the ball's bouncing around. Um, one was a post in, in the Georgia game. One was the play on the sideline. Uh, they had another touchdown against um, 
Western Kentucky where he caught a dig late and um, just high pointing the ball was able to um, come down and split two defenders kind of spinning around so <clears throat> those are things that again he's a he's a really talented player you look at their offensive production from the Georgia game and it just it just screams at you that the game runs through number two and number four and that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of talented players on that team either right I mean that's that's a talented roster but certainly those two guys have proven the ability to to control the game and to to make you pay if you're not aware of where they are so um we have to be aware of um you know his uh, opportunities to to um to catch the deep ball we have to play to a level of fundamental technical proficiency um you know in the in the situation where we have a post player and a man defender, we got to have two guys that that can vice the ball down. I mean, I think that's the you know I think probably the most frustrating thing about that that you know last explosive play was just um, you know there were two guys there that need to work together to down it. And you know there's going to be times in this game where it's going to take two guys. You know, and that that's okay. We can do that. Um, it's just about how we train it this week in practice and. You're never going to fully simulate that speed or, again, that catch radius or that ability, like I said, the balance and body control at the finishes. But we can show them. We can train it in individual. We can put them the best we can in a position, um, you know, within the plays and practice. And then ultimately, you know, you have to you have to trust that they're taking the message, they're taking the understanding, and on the field they're working together. You know, I don't want to look up on Saturday and see, you know, situations come up where, you know, we have one-on-one -on -one shots and there's no one in the vicinity to help. You know, we, we need to make sure not only are we in dominant position on those routes, but that there, whoever is meant to be the second man in um, is both tightening the window that the quarterback has to throw the ball and uh, helping to down the ball in situations where there's a circus catch made and, and uh, the receiver stays on his feet. Um, well, for, first of all, I, I, I want to be really clear that their running backs are really good too. So uh, let me not uh, fully take the bait there, uh, Billy. Um, when when you have a quarterback that's as dangerous running the ball um, as Jalen is, you you have to you have to have calls within um, you know within the plan that that are meant to take the ball out of his hands. Part of that on base downs can be um, a response to like true like read plays, right? Where his read is telling him whether to give the ball or pull it. And I think a lot of times in, in their scheme that those things are predetermined, honestly, I, you know, they seem to set the pull up with how they block in front of them. You wanna be careful not to totally abandon your structure because, um, Again, the minute you start to overcompensate, <clears throat> their running back will take the ball and go ripping 22 miles an hour down the middle of the field. So it's it's not you know you you can't what what, what we don't want to do is play a game where we're hoping something works right. We're going to play a structure. We're going to understand what that structure, where the weak points are, where where the strengths are, um, and we're going to vice the ball. Um, and, and set the run wall outside in, meaning we have great force leverage, and, and, then, and then build the run wall inside out, meaning we're great in pursuit. And there are gonna be times where you absorb some yards. I mean, it's, like you say, it's, it, you know, um, an eight yard gain, it doesn't beat you. A 12 yard gain doesn't beat you. It's the ones that, where you're either out of structure or um, you're not suffocating the ball in the perimeter. And again, I think against Milrow, that starts with, you know, force leverage. Um, the ones that go for touchdowns are the ones that get you beat. So, you know, you can't design your total package around um, taking the ball out of his hands. Um, what you can do is have calls within your package that, that do take the ball out of his hands, especially in the run game. 
And then in the pass game where he's, you know, equally dangerous in, in escaping and finding the, you know, the vertical puncture that leads to him circling the defense, it's, I, I don't believe in, I mean, we can add people to, um, to the rush that are responsible for spying the quarterback. I think just to put a spy out there, you know, is not to account for him. This is way more about, again, the fundamental technical aspects of how you vice a player, how you take space away from a player. Um, you know, just dropping someone out there and telling them to spy and then yelling at him when he gets outrun isn't, isn't the secret, right? I also don't believe in, um, you know, just voiding rush. You know, I don't want to see a defensive line that stops rushing and is trying to, you know, find where he's going to escape. I think this is about pocket compression. Um, it's about understanding the nature of how he escapes. It's about trying to find the finish points on the ball, but knowing that if we give him more room, um, he's going to be more dangerous. And there are examples of this um, from the season where you see teams effectively rush. And again, when he does get a, a breakout, which he will, it's about how we leverage the ball down the field. And again, it, you know, that means we have trust. That means we understand how the vice is set up and who's the force player and who's the inside out chase the cheek player and those are the things that help you uh, limit their ability to to be explosive and particularly explosive touchdowns Coach, a little bit of a curveball for you we're going to start all ball, ball boys in college football specifically how like there'll be two ball boys from the other team on your sideline and vice versa when you're in the sideline throughout your careers have you ever do you notice that that there's two two dudes like a different color shirt on and Um, you notice it, um, and on the whole, there, there's those guys are pros in the way they work. You know, I mean, they they do their job, and it's one of those um, it's one of those things that may not always make sense, uh, but it's just how we do business. You know, um, there's been a couple times where you get a chippy ball boy um, that can create a little bit of angst. Uh, and um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, fortunately, I the reason I got out of baseball is I couldn't hit the curveball, so uh, this will be a swing and a miss. Uh, but no, I, you know, on the whole, though, the, 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 there's there's very few times where there's really a problem, and um, most times when when there is or if there has been, um, you know, it 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 resolves pretty quickly, and you know, a lot there's a lot of emotion on the sideline, and so it's just. Um, it's an interesting part of the game, uh, something that certainly you notice, but seldom something that impacts anything that goes on on our sideline. Thank you. you bet. Circling back to the injury situation, what has Robert Steiner's philosophy kind of done for this team in staying this healthy up this point? Well, um, you know, I think he he's helped build a culture of toughness, first of all, where <clears throat> These guys, um, you know, mentally and physically feel equipped for the task. Um, the, the, the training philosophy uh, has built a foundation on our team of strength in the right areas. There's volume training or capacity training. Um, there's linear training, um, conditioning, and um, and I, I believe he's done a really nice job in the summer preparing the team for a tough fall camp and fall camp sustaining that through and then <clears throat> here in the season uh, continuing to pay attention to elements of the training that are helping our guys from mobility flexibility and against you know strength training I mean to hear him talk about it um, you know a lot of times in our conversations I just have to nod and and um, I mean, I like to think that I know a little bit about training, but I mean, his his understanding of what the muscles need, what the tendons need, and I know this firsthand because I, I I train with him three days a week. I mean, I'm I'm there with him Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning, and he even an old guy like me, like he's teaching me um, different you know modalities to to stay healthy. And for me personally. Um, you know, I, I, I feel as good as I've ever felt. And I can run around on the field um, 
for practice. I can, you know, sustain energy through the day, and a lot of that has to do with how he helps me, both from a mobility, flexibility, and strength training. So it's the same for our team. And um, I can't say enough about him, the attitude he's brought, um, how aligned that room is with the program we're building and the mission we're on, and and then the results physically that we see from the team. And I get excited to think about, you know, again, what what January will look like here the second time through. Anything else? Which players on the team have shown really good significant improvements so far this season? Uh, and how are you going to keep supporting the growth, especially against the top down the team? Well, I, short of, you know, naming, you know, a bunch of guys, I think we've, we've had players that have in a number of ways. And I think a lot of our young players are showing improvement. I mean, I was watching Jalen Lackey today and I, I just, he flashed as someone who is really starting to step into a maturity in his game. Um, so much of improving through the season is, is mental um, because the season's a grind. So uh, it's easy to start um, being discouraged if maybe the snap count's not there or worrying about, you know, um, the day in day out performance elements. I think it takes a really tough person just to have your head down and keep focusing on the work that needs to be done. And 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 Jalen would be an example of that um, for us. Bryson Coleman's another guy. Obviously Joe McVay who had the big catch. He's another guy to me that has stood out as someone who has just grown both off the field and on the field through the process. Um, so there are a lot of guys and, and obviously for our program to be successful um, we need to look at our roster and say our roster is improving you know east is a guy that stands out as that i feel like is playing his best football and it's really cool to see that because here he is three years in and it's starting to you're seeing the investment that was made in him and his physical tools taken over so as far as helping sustain um we just continue to coach i mean i we don't deviate from our process we we keep a focus on the the fundamental technical aspects of the game that we need to shore up we you know in fall camp we weren't training for virginia tech or for alcorn state or for georgia state you know we're training to 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 be at our best so that we can compete against the best and um you know we we wanted to be ready for each of those games and to varying levels we were or weren't but the focus continues to be on how we get the very most out of our roster, fundamentally, technically, and then in terms of the tactical understanding that that allows us to compete on a field against the country's best, because that's you know that's what the SEC is all about. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.